because we had dudes, we had food, we had everything but the actual word it was. And then instead of whatever the other word was, we had Marquis, we had all sorts of things. But the video itself was great. If only it was that simple. If only we were all that brave. I think as a um, as somebody that goes around different churches and speaks, when you look at the subjects you're given, one of the ones, you, there's two talks you want to avoid. Because you know, immediately everybody's going, he's not talking to me, he's not talking. It stops being a how-to talk, it, be, it feels like a you should talk. One is always about money, and everybody suddenly, you know, checks their shoes and you know, all that sort of stuff. And the other one is about sharing your faith. I don't want this to feel like a you should talk, although we all know we should. I want this to be more about how can we encourage each other to give it a go? Because actually it's not as complicated as we make it. We're not all called to be Billy Graham, but we are all called to bear witness. And I want to encourage us this morning to think about that as part of this, this how-to series that we've got going on. How to witness, how to share our faith. Last week, if you remember, if you were here, if you were awake, um, you'll remember that we, we did a, a bit of a break in the, the series. We, we did a bit of a Thanksgiving uh, talk about the Queen, because obviously we're in between uh, the death of our dear Queen and her funeral that was on Monday. Um, we talked about the Queen being a very public Christian, a witness but did you ever hear her tell you you needed christ no i cannot remember a time when the queen said in her christmas message by the way you're all sinners you need christ turn to jesus now and we're all going to have a happy new year she didn't do it but she bore witness she shared jesus with people and that's what we're called to do Jesus calls each one of us to do our bit and God will do the rest. Our bit might be tiny or our bit might be Billy Graham. As long as we do our bit, God in partnership will do the rest. So we know that the Queen was a very private woman, but she shared her faith in a very public way, both in what she said and also in the way she lived. And you remember last week we looked at her Christmas messages and how she became more evangelistic, more willing to talk about Jesus as those messages went on, as she got older, maybe as she realised she was running out of time. Are we all running out of time? And if you, look, if you watched anything on the, new, on the television over the last week, over the last 10 days, obviously there was a lot of coverage of the Queen, you couldn't miss that the BBC, ITV, Sky News were all talking about her faith in Jesus Christ and inviting guests on to talk about that fact. So not only did she bear witness, she created an opportunity for other people to carry on bearing witness. Wouldn't we like that to be our kind of final bit, the thing that people remember us for, not only for sharing Jesus, but to encourage others to do that as well even during the funeral itself people were openly talking on national tv about her personal faith in jesus christ they didn't just say she was a christian they made it very very obvious so i believe we too are called to bear witness so what does it mean to bear witness as the video said you know probably at different times we've all been a witness to something a car accident, a robbery, something, it's usually negative, something that you're a witness to, isn't it? Something that you're called to account to. You know, how many times, I know I've been, in, um, you know, seen an accident happen, a car accident, and somebody says, oh, you're a witness. You want, you're there to tell something that bad's happened. But actually, we're called to be a witness of good news, aren't we? It's the good news of Jesus that we're sharing. It's not bad news. Gone are the days a little bit of from uh, many decades ago where people thought that to bear witness about Jesus was to dangle you over a pit and tell that you were all sinners. And obviously that's true, 
but it's how you do it is how we will draw people closer to Jesus. Maybe when you became a Christian, you told somebody. Maybe you told lots of people. How many of them weren't Christians? When Poppy uh, was baptised a few years ago, my Poppy is nearly 16 now, which I think she was 11 when she decided she wanted to be baptised and we arranged for her to be baptised. She invited all of her friends. Do you know why she wanted to do it before she left primary school? Because they were all scattering off. And she said, this might be my last chance to share my faith with them. And it blew my mind that somebody at 11 had such an intimate love of Jesus and a love of her friends that she wanted to do something so public. We're all called to bear witness about our own relationship with Jesus. What do we do if we have a baby or if we, if we have a special event in our family? We tell everybody, don't we? I can remember being that parent. Oh, she started walking. You'll never guess. She, she can do three steps now. And you can see the other people go, don't look at him. Don't make eye contact. He's going to do it again. Paul and I had a conversation. Be fun, I'm embarrassing now because she's sitting in front of you. Paul and I had a conversation this morning and we compared our children, didn't we? We were saying, oh, how's your, how are your children? How are, and we just spouted off about how great our children were. We bore witness. It's not bore as in boring, by the way. But actually, witnessing isn't as hard as we make it out to be. We're all witnesses every day. Everything we see, everything we hear, all that goes in, we're a witness to. We can choose what comes back out. We are the filter. We choose what we witness others about. How do I know Paul is a loyal Coventry City fan? How do we all know that? Because Paul has bored us senseless for years. No, sorry, Paul. No, but Paul has shared it. He's witnessed to being a city fan. How do we know that Terry likes making stuff out of wood? Because he's told us and he's gifted things to us. How do I know what my Remy thinks, who, who she thinks is going to win strictly based on just one episode last night? Because she made her own paddle, she scored everybody and it's all been kept as a record. She bore witness. The reason we know is because they've told us, they've witnessed to it. None of them struggle to witness about that. Few of us do, it's called talking. It's called a conversation. But witnessing about Christ seems more difficult, if not terrifying. Talking about some, something we've read, something we've heard, a book we've enjoyed, a television programme we, we think is great and others should watch. We've all done it. We've all told other people. But witnessing about Jesus seems to be a little bit more difficult. So I just want to spend a little bit of time looking at why we should witness and then offer a few thoughts on, about how, a few things that might help. If, if you were hoping this is going to be an A to Z of how to share your faith, can't do it in 30 minutes, we could always organise something and, and talk about it more openly. But this is just a start. So why should we? I think there's loads of verses throughout the Bible that encourage us in sharing our faith, why we should. Um, mate, the first one is because we're commissioned to. We're told to. In the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, the Lord's command to us, his believers, is recorded there. Matthew 28, 19. Go, therefore, and disciple to all nations. Mark 16, 15 says, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to all the creation. Those words sound terrifying, but it's just the same as telling people what you read, what you saw, what you heard. It's just a conversation. Those words came after the resurrection, before the ascension. Jesus was giving his believers that final command, that mission, but a co-mission. He was going to be there. He was going to send the Holy Spirit to take his place so that they wouldn't be doing it alone. Each one of us, if we are a believer in Jesus, has been commissioned 
to share Jesus with others, to share our experience of Jesus with others. Another verse, John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And then verse 16 says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And I set, that, that you, set you that you should go forth and bear fruit. We're part of a bigger thing, aren't we? We're part of a, ch a Christian family across the world, past and present and hopefully future. We're all connected in one vine. But what does <clears throat> the worker do if that part of the vine dries up? If that part of the vine no longer provides fruit, well, they cut it back, they prune it back. But Jesus calls us as, as part of that vine to share Jesus, to grow that vine even further. We're all told to go forth, to tell others about Jesus so that many more can join the kingdom. We know that the Bible tells us that there are people out there that need to hear the gospel. But there are people out there that, that may never come to us and ask the question. Paul in Romans 1.14 says, I am debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to foolish. Each one of us is a debtor. Because we've got something they haven't got. We owe a great debt to the people around us to share the wonder of the forgiveness of Jesus, that promise of eternal life. If we truly believe it's so special, surely we want to share it. We owe it to our relatives, our friends, our co-workers, our neighbours, and everybody else to share what we've got. This church would probably be empty today if somebody hadn't shared it with you. It'd be interesting to see how many of us came to faith on our own without any help, without hearing it or witnessing it first. Romans 10, 14 says, how then shall they call upon him into whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without one who proclaims him? If people don't have the opportunity to hear the gospel, how can they respond? A study probably about 10 years ago um, talked about Easter. And there was few people that knew Easter was about Jesus. There was more people that thought it was about Easter eggs and bunnies and somewhere we've missed a mark. But it doesn't mean it's over. We can still pull it back. We must witness to grow the kingdom. We must also witness to reduce Satan's kingdom. We know the devil wants as few people to know about Jesus as possible. And he'll do everything he can to trip us up, to stop us, to discourage us from doing it. In Acts 26, 18, Paul says, to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the authority of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. We're called to turn people around. And it sounds terrifying, doesn't it? It sounds like something I would never do. I'm quite an introvert. Um, we went, where did we go the other week? We went somewhere um, over in city centre. Um, Andy was having her eyes tested, I was sat in a cafe and I could see across, you know, the middle bit where the, 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 the middle intersection of the city centre where the fountain is. And I was sat there and there was four guys shouting the gospel to people and trying to give out leaflets. And I thought, A, I could never do that. B, is anybody listening? And I really struggled with it. And if this was what witnessing was, count me out. It's not my style. But I know other people do that and it works for them. And people do respond. We've got to find a way to witness it suits us. Our personality, our opportunity. But we do need to do it. So let's look at a few practical points maybe. The first question to ask, I suppose, is 
Do you have any non-Christian friends? Do you have any non-Christian contacts? I used to, as many of you know, I used to work for an evangelist and part of my job was to go into churches and tell them how to witness and how we would come and help them witnessing. And one of the questions I used to ask them was, have you got any non-Christian friends? Thinking, I spend all of my time with Christians. We went to church together. We went to um, a school where mostly church families. I worked in a church-based organization. I went to a home group. Hang on a minute, where are my non-Christian friends? Do we have non-Christian friends? How do we witness to those that don't know Jesus? I think there are a couple of things we need to, to think about as an effective witness. Um, I think you just can't, for some people, as I've said, on, on, in the middle of the city centre, shouting the gospel to people, some people will stop. Some people will stop because they want to argue. Some people will stop because they're interested. But it's not always the most effective way. Because as soon as you start arguing, if they want to argue, they've got you. Because you're now going against what maybe you'd be saying. I think in our uh, witnessing, we are called to be a living example. We go back to the Queen. She was that living example of faith. And our witnessing calls us maybe to behave differently. Um, sometimes when we say things, they watch us and we behave differently. How many times have we heard that people criticise Christians for being different to actually what they preach? How many times have they witnessed us calling for people to behave differently only to see us making bad choices? How many times do we see us sharing our thoughts about Jesus only then to hear us gossip or judge others? And that just weakens our message. Do we need to audit our own habits? Maybe look at there are areas in our life we need to turn around. I remember a few years ago, and I may have told you this story before, Andy and I had some friends called Steve and Sue. They weren't Christians. And it became a habit where probably once a month we'd go and have lunch with them on Sunday. And we would, we would go to a local Anglican church in Coventry and um, we would arrange to meet them at a set time. Now the service was 10.30, we'd be over by 12. We'd say, we'll see you there at 12.30. Nearly every time we were late because the church went on. Service went on too long. Preacher went on too long. What did we do? We didn't arrive at Stephen and Sue and say, so, so, we always said sorry. We're always, I'm so sorry we're late. We didn't say the worship was amazing. We couldn't stop worshipping today. We didn't say we had to pray for somebody because there's this situation. We didn't say the sermon was really good. We didn't say this happened. We said, we're really sorry. Church just went on forever. We're really sorry the preacher just wouldn't shut up. We're really sorry it just, it just went, ran over. Which do you think they needed to hear? Because both were true. But actually, if you turn something into a positive, it's amazing how people start to listen to you. So we, Andy and I suddenly noticed that we, we, it was always a negative comment. So we said, look, we can either meet a bit later or you need to be ready that sometimes we'll be late because church runs over and we love going to church. And so then we started to say, well, actually, I'm sorry we're late, but the, the, the speaker went on a bit longer than I expected. But what he said was amazing and then told them. Or, oh, sorry we're late, we learned a new song today, so we sang it two or three times. It's this amazing song, we really loved it. And all of a sudden we turned a negative into a positive. Why would they want to come to church if it was our, the first experience we were explaining? We need to be a living example. So a few things I think we can do. I think the first thing we need to do is give ourselves to God. Sacrifice ourselves to God and ask him for guidance. Because unless we're willing to do it, unless we give of ourselves to do this, it's never going to happen. It's never going to work. If we give ourselves to him, our job, our family, our neighbourhood, our time, our choices, our opportunities. Then we get opportunity to do what God wants us to do 
rather than what we want to do. When Andy and I were first married, I'd got a job that I didn't want, and I kept applying for jobs that I wanted, but God didn't seem to agree. And then Andy, being the wise one, said, have you said to God you'll do whatever he wants you to do? And being a stubborn husband, I said, I will if you will. And so we decided as a couple that from that point on, our marriage, our life together was going to be his ministry. And we prayed and a couple of days later, God directed me into a different job and us into different ministries over, the, over our life. But actually, all of a sudden, it's felt like something had been opened up because it's that commission, that commission that God gave us. It was with him. He wasn't expecting us to go out and do it on our own. So I encourage you, if you think witnessing is terrifying, give it to God. Let God lead you. I'm sure Howard has prayed many, many times for God to lead him. Where does God need him in the ministry of Interop? He's given himself to God. And I encourage us to do the same. We need to pray for people. Pray for opportunities. I'm sure that we've got a list in our head of people we would love to see come to church. A list of people we would love to see Jesus in their hearts. Do we pray for them? I was encouraged the other week when uh, church has started asking us to pray for our young people, haven't they? It'd be interesting to know how many, no show of hands, but interesting how many of you took a, a card with a child's name on, how many of you have been praying? Because actually that makes such a difference, doesn't it? What a wonderful thought to have our, all of our children prayed for. Actually, do we pray regularly for those who we want to know Jesus? Many of you, I'm sure, have a better prayer, ministry, prayer life than I do. But actually, make a list. If, you can't, if, if a list doesn't work, use post-it notes. If the post-it notes don't work, put something on the back of the toilet door because you spend a lot of time in there. Do something to encourage you to pray. One of my colleagues bought some coloured lolly sticks and wrote a different name or situation on each one. So one colour was people, another colour was organisations, and another colour was situations. And as a family, they take so many of each out each day. So it's random. But they know they're going to do it each day. And I thought, what a way to do it. For them, it works. How can we find a way to pray for people, for, pray for opportunities to talk about Jesus today? How, when we leave here, between here and home, is there an opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus? Even if it's just that you went to church and the preacher went on forever, but he was okay. Please. Spend time with non-Christians. As I said to you earlier, just think about how many non-Christians you spend time with. And I don't mean like at the football match or something like that. You know, actually spend time with. A minister I know... Um, did the, whole, the same thing as I did. I suddenly thought, actually, how many non-Christians do I spend time with? And he realised he was spending time with no non-Christians at all. And he'd taken up running. And he'd been running on his own, headphones in, so wasn't contacting, connecting with anybody. And he thought, what can I do to change it? So he joined a local running club. He said he found out that they ran from the place where they all met, they parked their cars and they all did a run. And they stopped at the pub, had a drink and then ran back. He was like, okay, I don't have to have a pint. If I don't want a pint, I can just have lemonade. And so he started running with them. And he slowly started to meet with them. He took his headphones out. He slowly started to chat with them and meet with them. And was, you, you do that thing, don't you? What do you do for a job? Oh, well, a church minister. And then everybody else puts their headphones back in and starts running. <laughs> but actually, over time, he met people. And he wasn't in your face witnessing. He was just living life as a Christian, admitting his failings, admitting his struggles, but also loving people. And that's what we're called to do. The third thing that's important to know is that you are enough. If you don't think you're enough, you've missed that a bit in the Bible. Because God made you in his image. God said he would send his son for you. Not for the person sitting next to you, not for your mum and dad, not for your kids, for you. God says you are enough to be his disciple. God says you are enough and that he will give you everything you need to do his work here. 
So if you think it can only be the evangelist, if it can only be Bob, if it could only be Paul, no? if it can only be those who we, you know, we pay or train or send, you're wrong. We are enough. In the context of what he wants you to do, he's given you and will give you everything you need. You are enough. Next thing, speak about what you know. Don't speak about what you don't know. I had a situation once I was part of a, an Alpha course. I'd been one of the speakers on the Alpha course and we were at the, the away day weekend about the Holy Spirit. And we reached the point where it's now lunchtime <coughs> and a lovely lady who'd had nothing to do with church, had no background of any understanding at all, suddenly came to me and one of the person said, can I ask you a question? And at that point you go, because <laughs> you realize you know nothing really. You know just a little bit more than the person that, you know. And we confidently said, yeah, of course, ask us the question. And she asked us the most complicated question that I'd ever heard about Christianity. But for her, it was the thing, it was the hurdle, it was the stopping point that was stopping her becoming a Christian. Somebody had told her something years before and it was affecting her. And I thought, I don't know. But I knew it was important. And everything in me wanted to go, oh yeah, well, all you need to do is, but I thought, I don't know. I really don't know. And so I looked at my friend and they were going, and I said, okay, look, it's lunchtime. I don't know, but go and get some lunch and we'll try and find out. And we'll come back together in a bit and we'll try and work it out together. And so we went off and we got the computer on, we talked to other people, read bits that we found, and then went back to her and said, we think you've been told wrong. This is what it says. And this is what it means. And you think you've been told something different. By the end of the Alpha course, you become a Christian. Because we didn't try to talk about something we didn't know. 1 John 1 3 says, That which we have seen and heard, we report also to you. If you know it, talk about it. If you've seen it, talk about it. If you've witnessed it, talk about it. If you don't, be honest with them and say, let's find out together. Because lots of people want an opportunity to trip us up so that they don't have to deal with the reality of not accepting Jesus. But if we just bluff our way, it goes back to what I was saying earlier, then they just know we're not being honest with them. We need to learn to talk to people but only talk about what we know. Practice talking to people. How many of you like talking to people on the street that you just walk past? I don't. Yeah, I know you do, dear. Put your hand down. There's always one. It's always my wife. If we go somewhere, a church together, Andy and I, I love this bit. I love talking at the front because you don't really always talk back, which is great. Andy loves a bit after this where she can talk to everybody because God has given her a different gift to me. But actually, we need to practice speaking to people. Something I used to do with young people when we talked about sharing our faith, about giving testimony, I said, all right, I want you all to pick your favourite chocolate bar and write it on a piece of paper. And then we just randomly, we made them all walk around the room. Like when I shouted stop, they had to go to the nearest person they were and they had to convince each other who'd got the best chocolate bar. And then they, they would vote between them who had the best argument. And then the ones that didn't sat down and it would have ended up one against one. And they got so into it. Well, it's chocolate, it's important. But actually, so is Jesus. We need to learn to talk to people. Apparently, I've heard, if I leave home on a Sunday morning wearing my pink shirt, which probably most of you have seen, my next door neighbour, their granddaughter who's 21, goes, Darren's out of preaching again. Because she's seen my pink shirt that I preach in a lot because it's comfortable and it's got lots of space. She's going to have to get used to my autumn wardrobe because I've changed. But actually, we, we, if we learn to talk to people, she's, she's given us an opportunity, isn't she, to talk about going out to church. If we learn to talk to people in a simple way, 
that actually we have opportunities. One of my former trustees, and I've nearly finished, one of my former trustees, um, as she aged, she was able to do less. She wasn't able to go and be, um, do mission. She wasn't able to go and do things like Paul's going to do with Bob. But then in her last week, she was on holiday. She said, I want to go on holiday. She couldn't walk anymore. She could hardly see. She was very frail. And her carer took her to Bournemouth in a wheelchair and said, what do you want to do? She said, I just want to look and sit by the sea. Actually, what she wanted to do was every single person that walked past, she said, excuse me. And they'd look, hello, Jesus loves you. That was it. She never got into conversation. She never did any more than that. Jesus loves you. And then they'd walk, oh, thank you. And they'd go off. The next person, Jesus loves you. She died three or four days later. She knew it was important to keep talking to people, to keep witnessing. And finally, just talk to people in different ways. Recognize that if you've got people like me who are introverts, they're probably not going to want to talk face to face about Jesus. But if you have an opportunity to tell them about something we're doing here, invite them. Give them a leaflet. If you've got a new book that you thought was really good and you think they might be interested in this, look, I don't know if you're interested in this, but here's a book. Or if they're really chatty and if they're really keen, tell them about church. Tell them about something that happened to you. Your testimony. Because it will make a difference. Give out tracks. Put a poster in your window. A little hint. If you're a bad driver... Don't put a fish or a cross on your car. If you're a grumpy so-and-so, don't wear a cross on your jumper. Because you've got to not only walk the walk and talk the talk, it's got to match. Because we're all doing it for Jesus. I hope it's been helpful. I hope it wasn't a you should, but it's a how we can. If you want to talk about it more, come and talk to me. And if you think we need to do something more in depth, then let the elders know and we can do something. But for now, let's just pray. Lord, help us to know that what we've got in you is so, so special. Better than anything else we have in our lives. And Lord, help us to know that if it's that good, why aren't we sharing it? Why aren't we bearing witness to you in front of others? Just help us, Lord, to have the confidence to live our lives as a witness to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, we're going to have our final song. Don't forget there'll be tea and coffee at the back.